Hey everybody, my name is Ramesh Srinivasan. I'm a professor at UCLA, and um, what we have here is the cloud, right? And this is how we're talking about and thinking about the internet. We think about it as benign, as neutral, as part of our bodies. Clouds are made of water. 70% of our bodies are made of water. However, behind the cloud, just as we just heard, lie various political economies, right? These clouds are not necessarily open. There are various corporations that have terms of service, have various agendas, have various modes of ordering the world that exist, that form, that fund, that fuel the cloud. So if you even think about the very internet, it is a material infrastructure, right? And what's notable in this slide here is you actually see only two major cables connecting the global south the continents of South America and Africa. And that's very important because many cases we see the expansion of access to various technologies, but actually access tends to reinforce inequality. The rich get richer. So my interests are very much in the question of ontology. How do we rethink databases? How do we rethink networks? How do we rethink the very design of technologies to support peoples and communities on the margin? And so this is an example of a project I did back in the past with various Native American communities that had internet access, but the idea was how can we take that access and actually create a space, a public space that functions for these communities rather than simply an infrastructure. And part of that involves working with people's knowledges, people's ontologies, people's ways of speaking about and understanding the world. So this is very much like a totemic diagram, almost like Claude Levi-Strauss, ideas, concepts that are part of people's worlds. I've done work in the past 10 to 12 years with the Zuni community in uh, New Mexico, and this might seem simply like a pelt that's being examined by Zuni elders in a museum, but it's actually an indigenous map. And what's profound when you work with such communities and you think about digital museums and digital libraries and spaces is they speak about the world in fundamentally different ways. Fundamentally differently than the ways in which the West organizes such knowledge. They speak about these things through stories, the things people do, things related to people, places, entities, and times. And so we built a simple system with the Zuni, uh, with National Science Foundation funding, to try to support Zuni knowledge in particular authentic ways. And this was profound because this was an Anahoho, a Kachina. And what's incredible here is what you see is the ways people make knowledge at Zuni is embodied, it's collective, it's profound. It's many people looking at one computer at the same time, which is something we never think for granted, because people actually produce knowledge collectively as a community. Because otherwise, what our world has is an ordering of knowledge that's sequestered to the corporations that rule the world. And look at this, how Zuni pottery is described by Google as a commodity for sale on eBay. So. My work in the last several years has looked at media activism around the world. This is an image of Tahrir Square, where I've been working the past three years. Now I'm on a list and I can't go back. I also moonlight as a reporter for Al Jazeera and write op-eds for them. And this is a powerful, powerful moment all over this country, particularly because of this hype that was associated with this revolution. This is a t-shirt I bought in Tahrir Square. It doesn't fit me. It's on my friend's infant child. How could this be the case if at the time of the revolts, under 5% of people in the entire city of Cairo, let alone the whole country, had access to social media technology. Because what we tend to do is talk about a walled gardens, echo chambers, these ideas that technology somehow magically produced democracy. It's not about that, it's about people's voices, it's about rethinking the codes of technology, the networks of technology to support people's practices. This is an example of it, a, a where, you know, a, a very much a shack in Islamic Cairo only one electricity connection showing Al Jazeera Arabic, and the Al Jazeera Arabic reporter that I spoke to the previous day tells me he gets stories on Twitter. So activists are, are realizing and organizing mechanisms to subvert the agendas of technology to, s to reach much larger publics. And this is an example of that. A number of activists meeting in person, but much like us today, actually in the back of the room have a screen where they're engaging with people across the world and bringing people's voices who don't have access to technology to the street here. This is Khalid Abdallah, kite runner actor, major activist, the leader of the Mosarim Collective, realizing we've got to take our stuff offline, off these walled gardens, take it to the street, take it to spaces all over the country. This was signed by 30 million people in June of 2013. I was in the middle of these revolts, and this was actually started as an online petition. People rapidly realized we needed to reach people by reproducing it offline as a form of petition that people could sign. And I was here at this very distressing moment 
where we were organizing and revolting again in Egypt, and my friends were very inspired by this moment, but there's one major difference. There's a helicopter on top. And this is the thing, the myth of digital utopianism, that we somehow escape and generate democracy in such a way, but actually in many ways, the institutions of power can overtake such social movements. So this is very important to remember in the context of all our social movements, all our activism, all our struggles for social justice. Thank you. <laughs>